Uh, thanks to Jenny for inviting me. This is a great event. Uh, my wife and I have had the uh, fortune or misfortune, depending on how you see it, of moving around between a lot of the various institutions that are that are uh, that are that are here today. And actually, I mean, we've really enjoyed e each one of them. So the chance to speak to a group that, that combines uh, combines many of them is really nice. Um, so I'm going to talk today a little bit uh, about uh, two problems that arise uh, in thinking about the meaning of democracy. And this is a very hot area now uh, in political theory, I think in part uh, because democracy has become so central to the way we think about politics, not only domestically, but internationally, right? There are people in the foreign policy community who are advocating uh, the spread of democracy through various means. Um, uh, and uh, there also is a kind of rise, I think, in, in an understanding for a long time it was thought democracy would be the end of history, right? All of history is moving in a particular direction. And there was a book written called The End of History by Francis Fukuyama, suggesting that all nations would soon be democratic. And so we no longer need to contest the idea that's where things are moving. But more and more, I think people are starting to see that throughout the world, uh, and even domestically to some extent, that there are questions being uh, that are coming about about the meaning of democracy and about its value. Uh, so myself and colleagues at, at, at Brown and also at some of these other institutions are involved in a very lively debate about what exactly this thing means, right? We're all putting so much into uh, the value of democracy, but trying to clarify uh, uh, the meaning of it. And there's a kind of tradition, I think, of thinking about democratic theory and trying to clarify it uh, in a, a lot of these various institutions. So Alexander Mickeljohn at Brown, who many of these buildings are named after, is one of the great theorists of democracy in the 20th century. Uh, century. Uh, so the first problem that I at least want to, to raise, which is the subject of this book that um, I just published called Democratic Rights, uh, concerns that of judicial review. Right? There's a fundamental problem uh, that comes up in the United States when the Supreme Court, which has the power to strike down laws passed by millions, does so right in the face of popular uh, opposition, <coughs> opposition, in some cases hundreds of millions. Uh, so take uh, where Bristol, Rhode Island, which is known as the most patriotic town in America, uh, but there's a, a case, right, about flag burning which became central. Uh, Texas versus Johnson, where the Congress passed a statute outlawing flag burning and the court came in uh, uh, with a very strong opinion claiming that this law is unconstitutional. Or more recently, uh, uh, um, the case of Lawrence versus Texas, which concerned the Texas law uh, criminalizing sodomy was struck down by the court, even though the polling showed in Texas that there was popular support. So the puzzle is, why is it that in a country that considers itself democratic, right, uh, the Supreme Court, five out of nine people have the ability to strike down laws passed by literally millions or even hundreds of millions of people, right? The, an the anti-flag board burning ordinance was endorsed throughout the country and yet the Supreme Court strikes it down. So what's the justification that's given for this? Um, it's been thought by a lot of people that there can't be a democratic justification, that there have to be constraints placed on democracy, and that's what the Supreme Court does. But there would at least be an advantage if it was possible to rethink democracy in a way that could explain why it is that the court has a role uh, overseeing uh, the court as a constraint, right? We tend to think, often in politics, uh, the, the primary value for a democratic polity is the idea of self-governance. And so we can't give an, a justification based on self-governance for what the court does. Some people think that might pose a problem for the polity. So that's at least the challenge that I pose in the book, is to, just to ask whether this is possible or not. The first step in rethinking democracy is to just kind of start with the most common definition. Uh, majority rule, right? That's what a lot of people tend to think democracy means. It's just whatever most people want. But think of the flaw in that kind of theory, right? It has a sort of self-refuting or possibly self-refuting or self-destructive quality to it. If it's really just majority rule that we mean when we say democracy or self-government, what's to prevent a majority from disenfranchising a minority, right? You could have a vote in which a majority decided that some of the people in the polity should not be allowed to continue to vote. And yet our intuition, I think, about democracy strikes us that strikes us as deeply anti-democratic and non-democratic. And so what that suggests is that there should be some constraint on majority rule. That can't alone 
right be the definition of democracy. Uh, um, John Hart Ely, who was for a time the dean of the Stanford Law School, tried to solve this puzzle with what he called a precondition theory. His suggestion was, essentially democracy is about majority rule, but we need to ensure that the democratic procedures of majority rule are always guaranteed. So things like a right to vote, he thought, were always preconditions of democracy that had to be guaranteed, and a constraint which protected that would be anti-democratic. Another suggestion that Ely made was education, too, might be a precondition for democracy, right? It wouldn't make much sense to have majoritarian voting if people weren't educated to the degree that they could make a sensible decision within the majoritarian process. And in democratic theory, there are kind of versions of this that have uh, permeated. Some have suggested that you should imagine democracy as an ideal discussion among perfectly informed people, and whatever that outcome <laughs> um, ideal and democracy don't always go together, right? Um, so I think there are, you know, these are interesting suggestions, but I think that they're also deeply problematic. Maybe not as much. They solve to some degree the problems of majoritarianism, but there are still some fundamental flaws. For instance, uh, if it's really the preconditions of the of the procedure that are doing the work, imagine even, I mean, just play, or I'm going to put it up here so we get to play in, you know, ideals. Imagine that we really have all these preconditions met, and even the ideal procedures that people, uh, Habermas is an example of somebody like this, that they, that they pose. Uh, what if there was a revolt, right, among all the people guaranteed all these preconditions, and they decided anyway, even though they had been guaranteed them, they wanted to get rid of them? If it's really the actual voting and the actual procedure that's the ground, well then, it seems like there's no way to protect the rights in the first place. Anyway, the solution that I pose to the problem, or my suggestion, is that democracy isn't, in the end, fundamentally about procedures, as most of these people have thought, although I think that's part of what's important about it. But democracy is also, my suggestion is, about a set of values. And that once we see the values as also being, as being probably the most fundamental part of democracy that give rise to the procedures, there are also constraints on those procedures. In other words, rights that have to be protected in order to ensure the values that are also consistent with democracy. So if the Supreme Court intervenes to overturn a majoritarian process in order to protect the values, if the values are themselves democratic, perhaps it's acting democratic. If you look at the Constitution, there are all sorts of guarantees that I think fit that characteristic. The founders didn't think that the Constitution should just set up procedures that could have free sway, as good as they might be. They put certain limitations. So for instance, they prohibited um, laws in which the legislature, the Congress, would punish. They prohibited, in other words, what they called bills of attainment, right? The suggestion was that an entitlement of a democratic citizen was partly about participation, but there was also a certain limit on how they could be treated, even if a majority had decided to pass a policy or pass a law. One of the things the majority couldn't do was at random select people for punishment. That was a guaranteed right. Free speech, I think, also works like that. It's partly about enabling people to hear the arguments that would led them to make a vote that is informed. But it's also fundamentally for people who don't even participate in the process, who have a right to be informed and to hear arguments and to make up their own minds. That's not only about procedure. It's more fundamentally, I think, about rights of democratic citizens to make their own decisions. So there's a way, I think, if you look at these examples, to see democracy partly as about procedures, but also about constraints. And there's room, I think, therefore, if you think of democracy both about rights and also about procedures, to see the Supreme Court as having not just a role in a constitutional republic, but having a role in a democracy when it intervenes to protect rights. Now, of course, there's going to be a huge debate, and I kind of open this up in the book, about the meaning of the value. And a lot of the conversation is going to be about whether uh, the court was right in Lawrence versus Texas to claim that there um, that the right of gay couples, for instance, to intimate relations among people of their choice is consistent with the values or not, or whether the court overstepped. 
But that's a debate I think that we should open up as part of the discussion of democracy. So that's one kind of brief problem. I always like to solve all the major problems of political theory and political science within you know, 30, 40 minutes so that there's time for it. So I'm going to move to the second one, given that that was there are, of course, I'm sure, lots of you know, ideas. I'm just trying to provoke, I guess, thinking about this. But so that's the kind of first question. The second question that's really raised, though, by this value theory of democracy, that's the term I use to describe this, uh, is that it presents a certain kind of paradox. If the values guarantee us rights of free speech and free discussion, it all, they also guarantee, that's my daughter who always agrees. She's really good. She only, she only knows how to say yes, so that's very good. Um, the paradox is this that's raised by the challenge, and this is the thing I'm working on now and trying to think through. The paradox is this, if democracy is fundamentally about values which give rise to rights, including rights, robust rights of free speech, which I agree with, um, the paradox is what do you do with people who use free speech rights to attack the very values that are at the foundation of them? In other words, what happens to people who attack democracy within the polity? They're protected by the rights on the one hand, and yet they challenge the foundation of them seems like there's a kind of tricky dilemma there, that there's no way of getting out of this so-called paradox of rights. And current Supreme Court doctrine, which again I agree with, has a, uh, it's called a, a viewpoint neutral doctrine. It suggests that no person can be limited in their speech by force of law based on the content or the, or, 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 or the viewpoint or the, 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 the ideology that they're espousing. So even people with hateful viewpoints, which are deeply anti-democratic, and um, you kind of go through a litany of, of, of things about them that, that cause deep offense, right, are protected under the First Amendment. Think of the Skokie case, which guaranteed the right of even the Nazi party to, write, to march in a Jewish neighborhood. It's now seen as a kind of fundamental area of, of, um, of, of First Amendment jurisprudence. Well, what the Skokie case does is it uses this doctrine of viewpoint neutrality to protect a group, the Nazi party, which is clearly opposed to the very ideals of democracy. So given that it seems like the values, or at least I think the values, require these rights, what's to be said after that? Well, the first thing to recognize, I think, is that because it's values that are at the heart of democracy, these groups are granted rights not because of something about them, but because of something about the character of the democratic polity. That it's for us as a democratic polity that we allow these groups to exist, but then, and to, to, to espouse their views. But at the same time, I think it's important to, wow, we protect them, to recognize not only that they oppose democratic values, but to find ways that stop short of violating their rights to point out this contradiction, and to point out the paradox. So my suggestion is, is that rights importantly protect these groups against hateful, hateful groups, we'll just call them in general, um, protect these rights against coercive intervention, against punishment for the content of their views. But it doesn't protect them, these rights do not protect them from being persuaded that their views are not only wrong, but deeply anti-democratic. And the challenge that we have as a polity is to try to find a way to elaborate on the meaning of democratic values and to defend them while not violating rights. Well, there are a variety of ways I think you can do that by relying on persuasive techniques of citizens and the state. One obvious way is that citizens themselves can point out to these groups when they have an opportunity why they are in contradiction with democratic values, but there's also a role for the state to do it. Not in its role as coercer, there's a kind of tendency in political science in general to focus when we talk about politics on the state in its coercive role. When or should we not, when should, should we punish or when should we not punish? What is illegal and what is not illegal according to the criminal law? But there's a whole other function to the state, which is educative. Both in the formal sense, right, we have school curriculum, uh, which rightfully, I think, and sometimes even could do more, to talk about the history of the civil rights movement as a democratic movement that's not neutral about these groups, but that's actually at odds with them. The civil rights movement, I think, is rightly taught in curriculum as a realization in this polity of democratic values, and values that are continually and still under attack. 
That's a formal way of doing it. The state also has other ways besides formal education of exercising its persuasive capacities. So we have monuments, for instance, right? Not only to the civil rights movement, but to movements against groups that oppose democracy and oppose democratic values. And those two, I think, are not coercive. They don't limit rights. But they're a way of, I think, articulating the meaning of these democratic values and, in an important sense, uh, defending them. Uh, so these are two problems, anyway, that I've thought about in, uh, in trying to articulate what we mean by democracy. There are a lot of people who disagree, and there's a lively debate. I guess I'll just close on, on a kind of final point about, about the meaning of democracy. I do think that there's a tendency sometimes to just throw that term around to mean it's what we want or what we do or our common practice. And it's important as citizens, I think, for us to start to reflect about what it is that we think is the foundation of the polity and what it is that we think we mean by democracy, given how strongly many of us want to defend the concept. And so this has just been a, a kind of couple of puzzles that I've thrown out. I certainly don't claim to have resolved them in getting us to think about that meaning of the term uh, uh, democracy. So thanks for listening, and uh, it's a beautiful day. It will be a, 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 a great, um, a great uh, clamping, and but if people have questions, I'd, I'd be interested to hear your comments, please. Um, as you're talking, I'm trying to sort democratic rights from human rights. Yeah. And I'm also trying to sort in China and in Russia, where yeah. you see the vestiges of communism as you move to a more democratic society. Yeah. And how long or ever will any of that dissipate yeah. over time? Yeah. I'm just wondering if you've looked into those issues. I mean, human rights, the question, that's a, it's a great question, and it's one that's, I think, central to thinking about this topic. One of the things that, one of the big debates about human rights, right, think of, of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, for instance, right, um, one of the huge controversies about it is whether or not it's a Western idea, right, and some people have attacked the idea of human rights in the, with the idea that this is particularly the United States advancing, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt and people in the 40s who really pushed this idea and got the UN to see it as a kind of focal point. Uh, the criticism that came in particular from nations and still comes sometimes from nations like China is that this is just a Western idea that's being imposed on the rest of the world. Um, I actually don't think that's true. I think there's an idea of human dignity that's universal and that human rights are often grounded in. But one of the things that I offer in the book is another way of responding to the Chinese challenge. Because at the same time that China and certainly Russia now uh, even though they sometimes object to specific human rights, they claim often, anyway, if you listen at least to their rhetoric, to be democratic. I think in the Chinese case, that's actually blatantly false. I don't think it's a democratic country. But their rhetoric is not the same as when they reject human rights. They don't reject it, democracy as Western. They claim to be democratic. And almost every nation in the world at least has some pretense to be democratic. Well, if that's true, it might be that democracy as a foundation serves as a basis for a kind of common dialogue that we can begin with the Chinese in a way, for instance, that they reject when it comes to human rights, which they think of as just a Western doctrine. But thanks for that question. That's a really important question. Well, well I, you know, it's, it's interesting that when you talk about democracy in other countries, you can define it perhaps somewhat differently than we do. But I want to go back to your very first or second uh, statement of what you taught. I mean, we see the Bush administration believing that they can bring democracy to the rest of the world, and they choose a variety of ways to attempt to do that. Not all of them would be like choices. Uh, but you mentioned that uh, we have a, an idea, and I think I have that idea too, that democracy is eternally on the march, and that democracies are the destiny of the world, uh, of all countries, at some point in time, and that we are moving in that direction constantly. And I thought you were perhaps, going, as a political scientist, going to address the reality of that. In fact, whether we are moving away from that as an idea that the rest of the world wishes yeah, to I, adopt. I, I raise it. I mean, it was thought for a while at one point. This book that I mentioned by Francis Fukuyama was taken as just common wisdom that it's kind of based on this somewhat, I think, um, 
I was going to say strange or bizarre idea in Hegel in the 19th century that history has a trajectory that scientists could actually discover. And if you use the techniques of the scientists, you see where it's moving. And Fukuyama thought he could use kind of a scientific approach to show that every country in the world would become democratic soon enough. And it would, well, not only that, but his thesis was more radical, that they would always be democratic. That's the claim. Um, and I think, you know, it's just, I don't know, Sometimes there's a tendency of political scientists to overstate their ability. It's not physics, I don't think, or, or a hard science in that sense where you can really tell us what, you know, if political scientists could do that, right, they should be picking stocks and, you know, doing all sorts of things. Um, and Fukuyama, I think, just overstated his point and now recognizes it. It's very hard to tell what the trend is and where inevitably the countries of the world will move. I have a much more modest point, which is just that I think that democracy is uh, an ideal that's valuable, that should be articulated and defended, at least in the sense of argument. And Fukuyama, I think, you know, thinks in a much global, it would be a much, in some ways, right, maybe I'd sell a lot more books if I could tell you where the world was moving. Uh, but it's just a project, I think, that was too difficult to do. I, I have much more modest ambitions for the subject of politics. I think it's more about an attempt to try to articulate what we mean by certain terms and then to give the best defense of the ideals that we've been well, do, do you see a development of anti-democratic uh, nationhood in, in the world? I mean, do you have it's any sense hard, of that? You know, it's hard to tell, and you could go piece by piece. The trends in Russia, for instance, I think, you know, it's unclear. It certainly doesn't look like it's obviously moving in a democratic uh, direction. You know, there's an idea, at least from the, just stick with the talk, uh, there's a certain idea of consolidated power that what a, de what a democracy does is it just elects a strong leader who then can do anything. Because they're acting at the behest of the will of the people. And I think the 20th century, one of the crucial lessons has to be is that that idea is not democratic. Right? Um, I mean, certainly, you know, a lot of fascist nations came through democratic processes. Uh, Weimar Germany collapsed into Nazi Germany. Weimar was in many ways a democratic regime. Uh, but there's nothing, I think, about a strong leader in that sense that's unfettered by any rights that's democratic. And that people disagree with that. There are you know, opponents of mine, uh, Carl Schmidt is one, who think you know, democracy is just about giving one leader total power, unconstrained by any rights. And that, that I, think is, I don't really think it's wrong-headed. I think it's deeply, deeply dangerous. Are, uh, are corporate rights democratic or anti-democratic? So which ones are you? Well, um, the ability of a corporation to operate as an individual and make decisions independent of those who uh, the rights of the individuals make. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, a corporate right, for one thing, is different than the kind of rights that I've talked about, and that it's a group right, right? A corporation is one individual. Although, for the purposes of law, it's often treated as an individual, so a corporation can sue another party. Uh, but I tend to think that while Corporate rights are important in stabilizing an economy and setting up the rule of law. And when used properly, corporations, I think, can be a tool of progress. It's important. They're not democratic rights, at least in the sense that I'm talking about. Because I'm talking about rights of individual citizens. And I think it's just in the nature of the corporation that it's not, it's an entity, it's not an individual. It doesn't possess the same kind of rights. But, you know, it's an important point, too, to suggest I wouldn't want to say that all rights are democratic rights. There are some like corporate rights. You've talked about the kind of philosophic uh, dichotomies within democracy, uh, its kind of own opposition to itself at times. What about mechanistically? Uh, as you have two parties that have kind of polarized to gather the votes they need, that in itself seems like a something that is hauling democracy out to a certain degree because of the, the split that people begin to see themselves as Democrats or Republicans more than they see themselves as Americans. And from a mechanistic standpoint, is that something you're looking at? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's definitely right to say that when we look at democratic procedures within our polity, that there's, there's a lot of room for improvement, right? One thing is there's an idea that some people have of democracy as just a competition for power. And my suggestion that democracy is also about values suggests that really there's a different model that should be available to us, which is to think of democratic discussion as not just 
power battles between individuals or between parties, but also as an attempt to get at the fundamental principles that underlie the polity. This isn't just my idea, there's a kind of broad movement in democratic theory on this point uh, called deliberative democracy. I don't know if anybody's here from UPenn, for instance, but Amy Gutman, who's the current president of UPenn, has done a lot of pioneering work in, in that area, trying to give this deliberative ideal of democracy uh, voice. But is it an argument against political parties? That's a really interesting uh, puzzle. And people are interested, actually, Nancy Rosenblum is the chair of the Harvard Government Department, has a book coming out arguing that political parties are actually consistent with this deliberative ideal of democracy. Uh, I think she thinks, and I think, that we might need to rethink the way parties actually operate and that even elections operate to make them more deliberative and less solely about positioning and strategy. But I don't know that that means that we have to, her argument is that it doesn't mean that we have to get rid of the two party system. Would you comment on the Electoral College and what you said? Um, yeah, I mean, is it the Electoral College? I think, I, I think, you know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I was going to try to, try to answer without answering it. I mean, does it need to be scrapped? Even if it doesn't need to be scrapped, right? There are ways, I think, even within the current system that could make it more deliberative. And there have been points in history, right, where elections have been more about ideas, I think, and there have been some which have been less. And I don't know that a fix to the Electoral College is what's going to solve it either way. Do you support the uh, national there is a, vote? There is a, sorry? I said, do you support the national vote uh, movement? Um, yeah, I, mean, I guess in some ways, these are interesting questions, but they're a little bit far afield from, from my expertise, so I wouldn't want to jump into them. I gotta say, there is something about the electoral college that seems fishy, right? I mean, when we have, when we have, the truth is, when we have, when you, when you have elections in which the majority is at odds with the, with the wins, right? I think that's when it starts to come to a head. The problem is the way our system is designed, it's very difficult to reform procedures. You need an amendment basically to get rid of the electoral college. And that's a hard thing to achieve, and so you need the polity to be motivated. Sometimes, I mean, one thing that political theorists do is they think about possibilities like that, like imagine what would happen if this happened, what would happen then. Uh, in pragmatic politics, I think it's going to actually take a, a couple of elections, maybe even more, where the majority is at odds with the electoral college. When it will really happen, I guess, is when, um, I think, when we're when you really will see it is when the vote isn't close and the election comes in favor of the minority. Then I think you might see it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll take uh, maybe a couple more and then we'll, we'll go eat. Um, libel laws, libel behavior, um, yeah. educating people with untruths, yeah. which you can now do without any reply, so to speak, through the web or blogging or yeah. through the press. Uh, it seems to me that's starting to fuss with one of the fundamental. Yeah. We have the right of free speech, but we don't have the right to tell right. all lies. Yeah. I, I guess we do have the right, right. because no one prosecutes us if we do. Where yeah. do you see that from? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that's a great question, right? And the Supreme Court's intervened in libel law to guarantee I mean, it's pretty hard to show libel now, partly because the, the court has said it's an area of free speech, even among citizens, not even among the state. Uh, and that's kind of an interesting puzzle in itself. The challenge there too, I think, is, you know, again, it's another example, a really good one, of where rights protect tendencies in the polity, uh, and it's not inevitable that these tendencies will be counteracted, that are, that are in some ways counter-democratic. So libeling people in political debate, for instance, is not at all about trying to figure out democratic values, right? It's about just trying to destroy your opponent. Uh, but the challenge is I don't think that the court is wrong to suggest that there should be strong First Amendment protections, even in the area of libel law. So the real challenge, I think, for the polity, and maybe it's one that can't be met, uh, is to um, is to what? Is, is to find alternative mechanisms, alternative ways of speaking, to rise the level of debate as much as possible, to create incentives for doing so. Um, the other alternative, you know, the British don't have that system. They just intervene quickly, even to the point where members of political parties, right, can be outlawed, or at least their voices can't be heard on, on television. Um, and that seems to me to be not the, not the, at least for the United States, which has done pretty well with the first.
those rates the way yeah. they're not. It's a real challenge, a huge one. I wouldn't want to design it, but it's one I hope we could meet within the conference. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, the, the part of the, that, that current book, book that, that I, that something about is really about civil society, right? We think of civil society sometimes as bowling leagues and kind of nice gatherings and nice groups. It also includes groups which are, uh, which are, which are, uh, what? They're, as I said, hate groups that are antithetical to, um, to democratic values. One puzzle, and this is something that I'm in the midst of working out, is what do you do when I've talked about education? What do you do with, within the family, right? The way children are taught um, is at odds with some of the values that I've talked about. This is a very hard puzzle because rightly, even more so than when we're talking about civil society groups, the Constitution protects the rights of families, and I think it's right to do so. But there's an interesting, really hard, very difficult puzzle that arises when the values of a family conflict in some ways with the values of a democratic polity. And it can't, I think, certainly the state can't come in the way it does in some colonies and force change the way children are taught by their parents. But it's at least my suggestion as a puzzle that we should try to think about. Well, thanks so much for listening on the beautiful day.